Good morning. It's Monday morning. Welcome to Bloomberg Quint, India's first digital live streaming business news service. I'm Lee Dit Shah. You're watching Indian Open. Let's go straight to the headlines. The meteorological department says the intensity of rains will reduce over the next few days in Kerala as rescue operations go on in full swing to aid more than 7 lakh people who have been affected. Enforcer CFO MD Ranganathan resigns, citing his wish to pursue professional opportunities in new areas. The LNT board will consider a share buyback on Thursday. And 24-year-old wrestler Bajrang Punia wins India's first gold medal in the 18th Asian Games. Well, uh, the world markets um, are a benign place today. What's happened uh, over the weekend? Firstly, in terms of news, I think the biggest news flow was centered around uh, a nation which may not result in necessarily collateral damage, but is the largest oil producing country or oil reserve country, and that's Venezuela. President Maduro has ordered 96% currency devaluation. It's, he's, pa he's pegged the Bolivar to the government's petro cryptocurrency. I don't think any nation has thus far attempted to do something like this. And they plan to raise the minimum wages by more than 3,000%, which may affect local trade as well. So lots that's happened in Venezuela. Today is a day of reckoning of sorts. Lots of people. It's also a bit of a political crisis with the migration that's happening out of Venezuela into the Latin countries. So lots happening out there. Uh, from a market's perspective, whether or not this has any potential impact on crude, which I doubt really, but you never know. Uh, and that's something that we'll ask experts about. But that's essentially the news flow that's happening in terms of political flow. So Turkey is ebbed and uh, this is what's come up to the fore, which is uh, Venezuela. Of course, uh, the whole conversation amongst uh, uh, US and China dominated trade in Friday as well. And as a result of which some positive cues coming in. So the US markets ended marginally in the green, about third of a percent for the S&P 5. Dow Jones about half a percent, Nasdaq was flat and the Asian markets are taking cues from that, not so much from Europe but from the US markets. So mixed trend with some bit of an upside is what the world markets seem to be indicating, the SGX Nifty 2 indicating about a third of a percent in the green right now. Let's see how much do we rise and it was a while a range bound trade for most part of the week as well, Friday had a smart uptake. So we'll essentially carry on from where we left off in Friday. Because of that move, it aided a positive close for the week. Uh, broader markets uh, also remain in, a, in an attempt on a rally mode. The small cap index for the week was down about 0.2%. The mid cap index was up about 0.8%. So even the broader markets are attempted to make a rally. Maybe today's move also aids that. Uh, flows. Uh, well, very soft, but the negative flows ebbed a bit on Friday. FI is put in about 147 crores. DI put in the same 151 odd crores. The key to my mind is how slow the DI um, pumping in the money has become. It's nowhere close to that 750 crores daily average that we used to have, about 100, 150 crores, 200 crores at best on most days in the last 15 that I've seen. So that's something that stands out. What to watch out for this week? Um, I think a couple of important events, of course, the Jackson Hole Symposium this weekend would be important from a global perspective. A lot of conversation around if anything comes out of that, typically doesn't, but the language, the wordings that will be used will be important to monitor. And from our market's perspective, while the result season has come to a close, I think an important one, HDFC Asset Management comes out with its first quarter numbers. It's a newly listed stock, a lot of people invested and therefore will attract a lot of attention. There are a couple of others like Motila Loswal and a few others, but this one I think will demand attention, which is HDFC AMC. So this week, I think tomorrow is when the numbers come out. So this is something to watch out for in the week ahead. However, Stocks that you should monitor at 9.15 a.m. Aside of the usual uh, gainers and losers in stocks which are trading at highs or lows, I think two or three newsmakers today and a lot of large cap names. Uh, firstly, Larson and Tubro. As our headline stated, they've proposed their first ever buyback. The rumor mills, a couple of reports suggested the size could be up to 120 billion as well. Let's wait and watch. Uh, uh, what kind of impact it has on LNT. My guess is that it'll start off marginally higher, but let's wait and watch. Enforces. I don't know how big an impact could this have, but the CFO has resigned. It's for personal reasons, amply stated in multiple releases. So, may not have a big impact on Infosys, uh, but two uh, CFOs in the last couple of months have resigned. The HCL Tech CFO resigned, I think, uh, last month. Uh, now we have uh, the Infosys CEO putting in his papers as well. So, interesting times out there for large cap IT in India. And, you know, not too many stocks in news, to be honest, but I thought Hudson Agro was interesting. Uh, uh, 
age old company one of the largest in fact the largest private dairy the largest in south india and the promoter has acquired about 10 lakh shares a small percentage really of the overall equity but he's acquired about 10 lakh shares at about a 0.66% stake at about 719 rupees per share remember the dairy stocks have gotten beaten down a bit now the promoter steps in to buy some of the share capital should be interesting to see if this one has any reactions it's a very expensive stock it's not that well traded as well typically the volumes south of 20000 shares on an average day let's see if it has some impact of this piece of news or not however let's tell you what's lined up on first word today as the venezuelan president devalues the currency and aims to bring a new bolivar will the south american nation trigger the same concern triggered by the turkish lira uh, peter mcquire joins us on the phone line to talk about this uh, and impact on commodities as well agam then comes in to talk about what's aiding bata that stock is nudging new highs so interesting one to watch out darshan lists out the top 10 mid cap laggards after the end of the earning season Yatin takes us through why and what could be in store for Larsen and Tubro shareholders as a result of the buyback and as MD Ranganathan steps down and forces the founding members express their anguish at his decision to leave the company. However, big week for global markets. China and US will restart trade negotiations. Central bankers will gather at Kansas City Fed's annual Jackson Hole symposium. Turkish markets are closed this week while the Venezuelan president has decided to devalue the currency and eventually bring in a new version of the bolivar. So, how are all of these events expected to shape trade? Let's ask Peter Maguire, he's chief market strategist at FS Securities. Peter, good evening. Thanks much for joining in. Just wondering, does the Venezuelan crisis, economic and political at the same time, have any uh, collateral damage to any uh, any markets uh, any large markets in the world or do you think it will be restricted to venezuela and a couple of trading partners well good morning i think a couple of things um first of all it's going to be very much i think contained to venezuela in the short term if it's a contagion across other um south african nations uh, pardon me south american nations and that's just a That'll, that'll just be a work in progress, though I don't think anyone is really as um, in a dire situation compared to Venezuela, if you look across the, the, the South American landscape. Economically, you would have to question what, what on earth has gone on here, considering what Chavez was able to do. We've got one of the largest oil reserves in the world for any nation, Venezuela, and you know to devalue and then to have a, petro, have a, 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 a cryptocurrency you know, backed by Petro, it's just, I, I, I find it hard to even summarise. So it's, yes, and then you're talking about the Turkish situation, but at the present time, I'd have to say, it's going to be a very interesting couple of days how it plays out to the Venezuelan market and, um, and what impact it has. You would reckon no large impact on world markets. It won't be as high on the pecking order as some of the other larger nations would be, right? Well, I don't think so. You would you would say not. I mean, you know, the, the Turkish situation, I think it's got far more gravity um, considering its population base and where it's located in Europe. I mean, Venezuela's got a population of only a couple of million people. Um, you've seen a mass exodus so far as far as um, uh, their, um, their, their population moving across to other nations and, uh, you know, to live. Um, it's a little bit like, you know, probably in some ways the Syria situation without the civil war. Are we going to head down that pathway? Who knows? If you're going to see, you know, um, civil unrest, but it's certainly got the framework and all the understandings to, to paint a picture that's going to lead to great economic hardship and in turn, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, monstrous concern for its, uh, for its residents. Mm. Any... Any impact on crude, Peter, as a result of what's happening in Venezuela? Well, I don't necessarily think so. I think if you overall, if you look at the picture, I mean, the, the production coming out of the Middle East and all of the OPEC nations has been outstanding. Um, U.S. crude's, you know, pumping, you know, beyond imagination. And there just doesn't seem to be anything there to really, you know, underpin it to, to knock it, you know, terribly higher or, or lower. I think, you know, even with that US dollar the way it is, it's, you know, I think it's going to be range down unless you saw something dramatic happen from a geopolitical or a weather outage that, you know, had, you know, succession of hurricanes, you know, coming up the, in, into the Gulf that, uh, you know, if you had four or five of those, which you may well do, you know, it's common to have those in, you know, August, September, October, but nothing on the, on the, um, on the horizon at the present. So I'd have to say that's going to be range down. But as, you, as we all know, that can um, it can change very very quickly if you see uh, you know major concerns. But 
I, I, I think at the present, it's you know um, staying in these sort of range down trades. Okay, Peter, we'll leave it at that. Many thanks for joining in today and giving us that perspective. So, if at all there could have been any concern, it would have been around surrounding Venezuela. And that doesn't seem to be that big a concern, both on the economic front, more importantly on the crude front as well. So, contrary to what a lot of people tended to believe, this uh, may not impact, according to Peter Maguire. But you never know. Let's wait and watch. Uh, these things have a funny way of rearing their ugly heads when we least expect them. However, no ugly heads for Bata India. It surged over 20% in just a month to hit a life high. And that's because the footwear maker has a lot going for it. Agam Vakil is standing by to tell us all about it. Now, Agam, there are stocks which do well. Then there are some other stocks. And then there is Bata, which can't put a foot wrong over the last six months. Uh, that's right, Neeraj. It has certainly done well and uh, clearly outperformed the markets and uh, uh, clearly outperformed its peers as well. So uh, before we start talking about Bata, let's take a look at how it's done over the past one month or year to date for that matter. And as you can see, it's a clear winner when it comes to returns uh, as compared to Relaxo Khadim, Sri Leathers or Liberty Shoes. The reason why we sp chose to speak about Bata is because it's uh, made a milestone, a thousand rupee uh, mark per, per share. And that's, that's the reason why we thought that we could take it up and you know, discuss the footwear industry. So in terms of what's really worked is, of course, uh, it's a push of premiumization, higher pricing, and it's, it's seen higher realizations despite the fact that the last financial year was when they did see about, well, uh, flattish volumes come through. Among other factors that are working, well, it, it has uh, added 82 new stores and it's well in, in, on track uh, in terms of store expansion going forward. As, as you can see, it's currently at just shy of that 1400 mark when it comes to the number of shores, uh, stores. But by FI18, we it had about 1375. Moving in, uh, we need to understand that, uh, you know, Bata is in a beneficial place considering GST has come through because it is gaining market share at the expense of the uh, unorganized sector. And given the fact that it is also passing on the incomplete benefit of uh, lower GST rates, uh, that's something that's been spurring and it's been working in favor of Bata. Of course, uh, it's also gaining market share, as I said, suggested, on the, on the expense of the unorganized sector. So moving in, uh, it's also putting in a lot of investment investments when it comes to advertisement and marketing and in fact as ad spends moved up by 60% in the last financial year and it's, it's of course it's also signing a lot of celebrities in order to endorse the products and to push from, from mass premium to premium that's the segment that they are working for. But uh, let's move in and take a look at some of the key uh, return uh, ratios. For, for ROE, it stands at around 19%. Return capital at around nearly 26%. So largely healthy as long as it's above the mark of 15. Uh, that's per the, uh, the benchmark. But uh, let's take a look at some of these challenges too. And well, we, it, we do have flat volumes for Bata coming in. This is a time when a lot of other cons uh, consumption companies have actually seen double-digit growth. That's when Bata has only seen well, well, flattish growth, despite the fact that we've seen an uptick in demand. That said, its transition in turning from brand from mass to, or rather mass premium to premium, is something that it is going to have to work on. That could be a challenge moving forward. Let's not forget, in terms of valuations, that's where, well, Bata stands right at the top. Of course, Relaxo Footwear is the most expensive at this point in time. And this is trailing price to earnings ratios, uh, considering for a lot of these companies we do not have projections for FI19. But as you can see, FI18 price to earnings, it's the lower, one of the largest market market capitalization and almost in line with Relaxo Footwear at 60 times. So uh, let's say if you do uh, you know, see a uh, growth coming through on the bottom line, we're likely to see that, in uh, that for forward uh, price to earnings when it comes to FI18. Well, and once again, we have nearly eight or on the or on the Bloom, or eight analysts on the Bloomberg uh, consensus, which have a buy rating that's sixty six percent, two for sell and two for hold. So we clearly see analysts who are positive. However, when it comes to the price target, the average price target, well, it does indicate a 16% negative return potential. So it does seem that Bata has run ahead of its fundamentals, at least based on valuations. That said, uh, there is plenty of opportunity, especially given the large market that Bata has, along with a, a lot of its uh, other peers as well. And this is something that we need to watch whether or not that is going to correct going forward. 
Yeah, Agam, just one small question. Uh, I remember in a conversation when Bacha had with you, they had mentioned that they expect high single digit same store sales growth for FI 18, 19. Um, how does that compare to what the company's traditionally done over the last three or four years on average? It's, it's largely uh, in line, perhaps a tad better than what they were expecting, and they're banking largely on the recovery and pickup in demand. So it shouldn't be a bad number considering uh, they're looking at uh, single stairs, uh, single digit. Uh, or growth in the growth. SSG, yes. Okay, interesting. That plus the GST benefit, if at all it comes about, and a few other things might well, ensure bottom may stay at these higher valuations. Who knows, Agam, thanks for putting this into perspective. So that's one reason, or that's multiple reasons really, summed up in one piece as to why Bata is doing what it is doing. But we just can't talk about the good things all the time. At times, we also need to make out what are the companies that have come out with a poor quarter. Now, Darshan, remember on Friday, listed out the top 10 mid-cap performers which beat expectations by a long distance in the last earnings season. Today is the turn of the 10 laggards which missed estimates by a mile on the operations front at least, Darshan. Uh, what's the list looking like? Yeah, so has a couple of banks also because you've seen that how, you know, how some of the PSU banks have performed. But uh, let's start uh, with the list and a uh, couple of companies that uh, we wanted to point out. Uh, Tata Coffee was a weak set of numbers, even though, you know, revenues grew 15%, uh, profits were down 37%. And look at the EBITDA margin that moved from almost 22% coming down to just uh, 16%. Now, a couple of reasons why Tata Coffee didn't do well. First of all, the raw material cost and and expenses were much higher this time around and weak plantation business due to low, pro low production uh, this time around. So Tata Coffee is the first stock that came out with a poor set of numbers. Uttam Galva, again, you know, revenues were down almost 90%, even though uh, revenues were down 90%, EBITDA was down uh, at, at a much lower pace. That's why you have your EBITDA margins up 6.5%. Uh, but mainly, if you're looking at the finance cost, that's managed to double. The net loss has actually gone in from 200 crores to almost 360 crores. So extremely weak set of numbers. Financial cost was the main reason why Uttam Galwa didn't come out with a strong set of numbers. Overall, it's rather weak. Uh, Lakshmi Vilas Bank, uh, look at the NI. NI is down 40%. From a profit of 66 crores last time around, it's moved to 125 crore loss this time around. The asset quality has become rather weak for the bank itself. If you're looking at the net NPA, uh, while provisions have improved, have gone up significantly, the gross NPA and the net NPA, both of them increased for the bank. So, weak set of numbers from Lakshmi Vilas Bank. The fourth one is a uh, Bombay dying uh, this time around. Revenues down almost 30% from a loss of uh, uh, from uh, from uh, the its losses moved to almost 93 crores, and EBITDA margins are just 2%. Mainly last uh, over the past few quarters, we've seen that the real estate business has contributed, but this time around there was weakness in the real estate and the retail business for the company. As far as the next stock is concerned, Prestige Estates again revenues down 33%. Uh, profits has improved, but look at the margins that's come down to almost uh, 25% this time around. Mainly the uh, there was this exceptional gain of 89 crores uh, uh, that aided the revenues this time around. But the new accounting norms imp impacted the financials, so more of an accounting change that has happened. And that has also affected the other real estate companies. Look at how DLF has panned out in trade. So DLF revenues were down 26%, margins down to almost 20% for the company. Apart from it, if you're looking at uh, the, the finance cost has gone down, but nevertheless, it was the end AS uh, uh, number that actually uh, uh, impacted it. Obviously, because of a one-off this time around, the share of profit, uh, the profit numbers was my, much higher, but again, because of uh, the accounting norm change that was there, that affected the financials this time around. And land and capex purchases were much higher this time around, and that increased the net debt for the company. Uh, the next stock that we want to talk about is uh, Symphony, and this was a big howler. 23% uh, top, uh, top line uh, uh, fall, uh, profits were down almost 50%, and margins down to just 11% for the company. Mainly, the summer was weak. Uh, there was subdued air cooler business, uh, weak demand sentiment, inventory levels were much higher this time around at the dealer level and all of that impacted the business for Symphony uh, in the first quarter. Uh, the next one is KRBL, extremely weak set of numbers, 14% uh, top line uh, decline, 11% uh, bottom line decline for the company. Overall, weak set of numbers, uh, uh, the entire uh, rice business not doing well. Glenmark numbers were also rather weak, uh, revenues were down 8%, profit was down 30% and margins coming down to 16%, which is one of the lowest. Uh, their US business did not pick up this time around. Their India business 
business also was also very very sluggish gross margins were low this time around uh, debt rose almost 11 million uh, uh, dollars uh, on a quarter on quarter basis increasing the working capital so overall uh, a very weak set of numbers and finally a couple of more counters first of all syndicate bank uh, look at the ni ni down almost 5% the net loss going to almost uh, uh, 1300 crores so weak set of numbers asset quality also hardly any improvement there uh, almost 13% uh, is the gross npa uh, 6.5% is the net npa there so syndicate bank also coming out with weak set of numbers so near 10 companies which came out uh, with weak numbers and most of the stocks have also reacted in a similar way post the numbers mm, well, 10 companies that darshan has chosen and having a flavor of consumers as well with the likes of krbl and symphony featuring in addition to banks darshan thanks for putting this into perspective so well over the last two days if you saw this piece you got a sense of uh, well, at least 10 companies which did really well and at least 10 companies which did really poorly um, in the quarter gone by now, on to the next piece of news, and that's Larson & Tubro. It's looking to reward its shareholders. The board will meet on the 23rd of August to consider a buyback. But analysts are not convinced that LNT has the balance sheet strength for it. Interesting. Um, Yatin Mota is here with the math. Yatin, thanks so much for joining in. And um, I, I thought they raised some capital and therefore would have uh, the leverage to be able to con conduct this buyback. Yeah, so uh, we are not saying that uh, there is no balance sheet strength. Uh, what we are saying is that uh, the company, uh, you know, is in the, into a growth phase. Uh, they have, you know, uh, uh, given their guidance, uh, which is almost, uh, you know, double digit in nature in terms of the revenue growth. Order inflow has been quite healthy in the first quarter. Uh, so if you look at uh, the picture X divestment, uh, you know, they are on a growth path. And when you are on a growth path, uh, you know, probably you need some cash to, you know, really push up projects and uh, ramp up your execution. Uh, if you look at the balance sheet of uh, LNT, uh, you know the secured and unsecured loans are nearly uh, 73,000 crores. Uh, uh, you know, uh, you know that is the kind of secured and unsecured loan. Of course, the net debt figure would be much lower because uh, the current investments, uh, you know, and uh, the kind of uh, money that they have uh, sitting on uh, the books is close to uh, 16,200 crores as on June. And the net current assets for the company is close to 19,200 crores. Of course, this is uh, you know working close to $2 billion in terms of cash that they have on the balance sheet. However, if you look at the net debt to equity ratio, uh, as per Market Mojo, we got the data from that particular website, which is our data provider. Uh, the total net uh, debt to equity is close to 1.74 times. And uh, if you look at the book value also, that is close to 450 rupees per share. Now, if you look at the share price performance and probably uh, the buyback would uh, you know address that particular front, on a YTD basis, the stock is down, uh, you know, 1%. And on, on a one-year basis, the stock has given returns of only 9%, wherein we are trading at record highs. Uh, so probably it makes sense for the management to send out a signal to the shareholders uh, that, hey, we are looking, uh, you know, uh, to enhance the shareholder value. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, you know, uh, you look at uh, the uh, overall uh, analyst, uh, you know, take, uh, they say that uh, they might signal uh, that uh, the management believes, uh, you know, the true picture in divesting the non-core assets. However, on the other uh, ha hand, it paints a picture uh, wherein the buyout generates better returns uh, than the current ROE. Uh, so that is the kind of, uh, you know, analyst uh, commentary which is coming in. Uh, we have also done a scenario, uh, Neeraj, wherein, uh, you know, we believe uh, that uh, the the three bands which are likely, the, the most likely ones, and, you know, brokers have been talking about it, a 5% premium to current market price would mean a buyback could happen at a price of 1300 rupees per share. If you consider the 10% uh, premium to current market price, that will be 1365. Uh, that is the most likely scenario. And if you offer a 15% premium, that will be close to 1426, very close to the near 52-week high. Uh, so it will be very interesting to see how really, uh, you know, is the premium uh, to the current market price pay, uh, placed when it comes to the buyback. Of course, we have a whole host of public sector uh, undertakings which are shareholders of LNT. Uh, LIC is holding close to 18% stake. The employee fund holds 12%. Uh, GIC and uh, SUTI, uh, you know, these are again the two uh, listed entities uh, which hold a little uh, uh, close to, uh, you know, two percentage points and other funds being ICSA, Prudential Mutual Fund and HGFC Mutual Fund. However, if you were to believe CLSA, uh, they are positive on the stock. Uh, they have a, you know, buy rating with a target price of 730. Uh, they believe that a 4,500 crore worth of uh, estimated buyback will add 85 basis points to ROE. And if you look at the company's ROE at the current level, it is 
you know, close to 13 percent. Uh, so probably that level could be closer to 14, 15 percent as we get, get into FI19, uh, you know, earnings base. And they say that uh, LNT is fulfilling its guidance of going asset light. And the recent divestments uh, which uh, the company did, which uh, that was close to, uh, you know, 4,300 crores. And that is exactly the kind of quantum uh, brokerages are talking about. Uh, could be uh, the, you know, buyback math uh, going forward. And also, uh, they say this could uh, be, uh, you know, one of the starts of the buyback because uh, the cash on book is close to $2.1 billion. And in the future, we could see more buybacks coming in uh, from companies like LNT. Mm, interesting. So, a lot of uh, divestments which will lead or asset sales uh, yeah. from LNT side which will lead to buyback. Uh, will not necessarily be a factor of the balance sheet if the C if CLSA is to be believed. They believe that this will not be the first of the buybacks. There will be many more buybacks. So, Neeraj, if you look at the balance sheet position, they are not in the capacity to do very large buybacks. You know, mm. there have been uh, market voices which say that uh, the net worth, uh, 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 you know, calculation shows that the buyback could be up to 12,000 crores. But, uh, you know, there is a very low possibility that, you know, the buyback could be of such a large quantum. It will be probably just sentimental, you know, a three 4,000 crore kind of a buyback. Uh, because the balance sheet really doesn't support that kind of a big, uh, you know, buybacks to happen because they, they will probably need cash as, as they expand. And remember, this is a consolidated picture that we are talking about. Uh, there are a lot of other listed subsidies in which the cash sits on those companies' balance mm. sheets. Uh, you know, so, you know, the pull out cash on a consolidated level from those balance sheets will be uh, very difficult. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, th that point we need to keep in mind because they have uh, two uh, IT services and technology businesses listed. They have their LNT finance listed. So, all of that is consolidated into one, uh, you know, single entity. And, you know, probably the kind of cash that we could see optically on a consolidated level uh, could not be the reality with LNT on a standalone basis. Uh, because then they would require that cash for you know expanding their projects, hmm. investing in projects, and probably look at some uh, you know working capital requirements as the business grows. Well, interesting analysis. Thanks a lot for that, Yatin. Thanks for putting that into perspective. Well, so. Um, if our analysis is to be believed, you will probably not have a very large buyback coming in from LNT stable. Nevertheless, it's a buyback and it might have an impact on the stock in today's session as well. Uh, well it could, uh, there could also be an impact on Infosys because it seems unable to get past the leadership troubles. This time around, the chief financial officer MD Ranganathan has stepped down. The country's second largest IT firm will begin the search for the next CFO immediately. That's all that we have on First Word today, but that's lots more lined up on Indian Open. We discussed the overhang of weak summer sales for air conditioners with Jasbir Singh of Amber Enterprises and how does Shimaru plan to increase its digital revenues as India consumes more and more data. We ask CEO Hiren Gara about the same. But after this break, a full tilt towards the day's trade.